Well, greetings, and we're glad that you're back again today. We hope that your day has been, those of you on the other side of the world, that your day has been good, that you've been able to move forward in our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And those of us who are just starting our day on this side of the world, we pray that God will give us much grace, hope, and love to be able to walk through the journey of this day. Welcome to another Discipleship Empowerment Word. We are continuing our journey on studying the word hope. We've been here for a number of days and we probably will be here for another number of days, but I think it's such an important word. That's why we're not taking a lot of time to hurry through, but we're wanting to speak and to focus on what the scriptures have to say concerning hope. Because when people are feeling that things are hopeless out there, we need to encourage them that in Christ Jesus, there is hope. And I love what Paul is trying to do as he was talking to the Roman church, trying to encourage them to walk in a spirit of hope. And we need to be walking in a spirit of hope. You know, the Christian journey is a journey of movement, of walking, of going forward, not just sitting back and watching the world go by. It's an active act, something that we need to do that James says, don't just be a hearer of the word, but be a doer also. And so what we need to do is be people who are doers of hope. We need to be shining forth a light of hope to the world. Amen. That's what the church is all about, to be an example of hope. And so that others may see that because there's hope in us, there must be a real God. God is alive and well, and he's moving through his people. And he's empowering them by his Holy Spirit with hope. And that's what we need to be looking at each day and saying, Lord, how can I be a channel of your hope today? And uh, any of these uh, discipleship empowerment words are words that I believe that the scripture gives to us and that we need to activate. Amen. So I'm glad that you joined us today. Thank you for all you who are waving. I'm waving back at you and may the Lord just be with you. So let's start our journey now as Paul speaks to the Corinthian church. It's amazing that, you know, again, I, I know there are certain things that I have to keep reminding ourselves, not just you, but also me, that these are letters written to the church. And we need to remember that God is writing and trying to speak to the church. Those who have given their lives to Christ, those who have committed their lives to walk and to follow after Jesus Christ, he is writing letters to them and that he wants them to be a light, you know, for his glory unto a lost world. And that's how the church grows. It grows and multiplies by the Holy Spirit working in and through the disciples of Christ. Amen. So when we go to Corinthians, Paul is speaking to the Corinthian church. And now we've talked about it before, how much of a challenge sometimes that the Corinthian church has faced. And uh, because they had all kinds of strange things going on. And so Paul's letters often is written, when they're written to the Corinthian church, he's trying to straighten something out or correct something or to speak into their hearts and to get their attitude looking in the right direction. And that's I think sometimes that's what I'm trying to do each morning is say, have an attitude check. What is our attitude? What is it we're thinking about? You know, how can we, you know, change so that God will be glorified? You know, someone was talking about yesterday and praying about this whole idea of revival. Revival is real and God wants to revive us. But revival, the foundation to revival is a willingness to change to move from disobedience to obedience, to move from sin to unsinfulness, and to walk and be covered in the righteousness and power of Jesus Christ, to be anointed by his Holy Spirit. And when those things begin to function and move in our lives, we will see revival and we will see change. But it's not to say, oh God, you change them, or oh Lord, you change them. Really, what has to happen is when we pray and say, oh God, change me, O Lord. And when we change, we ask him to change us and he, we begin to be obedient to his change and hope in what he says in his word will take place in our lives, then revival breaks out. Amen. And revival is always centered around the word of God itself. 
You know, when we get into the Word and the Word gets into us, it stirs up something and it brings about change. And change is being able to hope in those things not yet being able to see. And trusting God that down the road, that as we walk with Him and He walks with us, that there will be change and that, that change will come even a greater faith and hope in Him. So when we go into 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 10, Paul is talking about this whole idea of, of harvest, getting about a, a change that will take place. And he's talking about how we don't muzzle the ox and how the ox not needs to be free, free to eat of the grain. And, and then he goes on and he says in verse 10, or does he say to it all together for our sake, for our sakes, no doubt this is written that we who plow should plow in hope, and he who threshes in hope should be partakers of his hope. So here he's giving a, an illustration of a farmer. And he's talking about when a farmer begins to plow, he's plowing in hope. He hasn't even planted a seed yet. But he's plowing in hope that when he gets the ground ready, and that's key. That's why we need to pray and ask the Holy Spirit, get, help us to get the ground ready to move it from a hard pack soil, from a rocky soil, from a soil that's full of weed to a soil that's going to be ready to receive the word. That's why prayer is so important, because I believe that prayer is what gets the ground ready. And so that's why the church needs to be, you know, a church of prayer, or as even the scripture calls the church, a house of prayer. And as we're being a house of prayer, it's interesting, people who gather together for prayer, they're gathering together for prayer because they hope something is going to change. Amen? That's why we're praying. Our church is spending three days now, uh, uh, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, meeting together in the afternoon through Zoom, and we're praying. And the reason we're praying, because we have the hope that as you pray, that the power of prayer will change things. And that's why when two or three come together in my name, I shall be in the midst of them. And so he's saying that he who plows should plow in hope. So if we're out there plowing in hope, and, you know, we need to be then doing it because of hope. But then also that because of hope, we then inter interject the seed into the ground. And then after the seed has been in the ground, it begins to get nurtured in that. And again, this is a whole hope process. You know, we need to be farmers of hope. <laughs> you know what I mean? Hope that when we put the, the, the plow of the ground, that something's going to be ready. Hope that the seed is going to germinate. Hope that the plant is going to mature. Hope that, as he says here, that we will be partakers of the harvest. And I think that's what God wants us to do. I, want, I think every church, every disciple, you know what he wants? He wants us to bear fruit in hope and be partakers of his harvest partakers of his harvest there's a great blessing out there but even in the midst of some of the challenges and trials that's why paul talks often about how you know some of these things are like mystery because they're hard to understand you know do we really understand how a seed when it's planted how it gets from a, a seed to a plant from a plant to a nurturing and from nurturing to a harvest well some of us might scientifically know how to how to understand all that but for many of us it's a mystery it's a thing it's something that god gives that eternal thing that was in within the seed that he has built that which is unique and when it's been planted in hope, I believe also we can harvest in hope. And he says, and I like what he says here. Paul is saying that that this whole idea that and he who threshes, he threshes in hope, that he should be a partaker of hope. So we're planting in hope. We're involved in nurturing in hope. Why? So we can be partakers of hope. I think God wants us to partake in hope. That's what he's saying here. Now, I know the context a little bit more of the scripture is talking about, you know, Paul is saying, hey, we're pouring into your lives and we're, we've been coming to you in that. And it's important that as disciples, you know, we're in this all together. We need to help one another. And so as Paul was saying, you know, we're hoping that as we plant in you and as we nurture in you, you will both plant both physically, emotionally, and spiritually back into us. And that's why he goes on. 
and talks about, you know, how important it is to that they also get a chance to reap in hope. You know, a lot of things we do as, you know, as missionaries and things that we're planting in hope that there will be some type of harvesting down the road. It may be in our lifetime. It may be in a week or two. It may be in months. And it may be not even in our lifetime. But we have the hope that somewhere along the line, you know, something will get planted. <laughs> Someone shared with me yesterday, you know, some of the things you're doing, Jim, you may not see the results in your life. But let me tell you, with technology and everything, and if the Lord tarries, it could go on and on and on for years and hundreds of years if the Lord tarries, you know. And here this guy had a great, I believe, a great vision of hope. How things can, if we continue to plant, God can use. You know, a lot of people that do things, you know, in our world, never see sometimes the harvest. I think of Watchman Nee. I've read a lot of his books, and he's an interesting man where, you know, he planted and planted in China, and they ended up jailing him, and he ended up dying. And not much happened until around the 60s when someone came across his writings and began to translate them. You know, he's already dead and gone. He's not going to make any money on his books or anything. He's already dead and gone. But then as they translate them, those books spread around the world. Books that is not only the books, but his testimony and has touched millions of people. Isn't that amazing how God, even after we're gone, you know, sometimes the things, you know, I see almost every week on, on YouTube, someone rebroadcasting one of Billy Graham's sermons. They kind of keep get bringing it out. I mean, Billy Graham has been gone for a number of years already. But, you know, people have hope that the message, that the message that he was proclaiming and the message that others have proclaimed will still, if planted, will bring forth a harvest. And that's what we need to do. We need to believe as a church that we have a hope in the mystery of how this all works out. You know, I've told people many times, that I have been able to reap, to harvest in, on the other side of the world, things that other people who have planted and died years and years ago. I work with the scriptures in the Kachin language. I work with things in the Kachin language as a dictionary and writing things. But you know, if the Ole Hansen, Dr. Ole Hansen, didn't spend 30 years planting the seeds, getting the language written down, getting a dictionary put together, getting the Bible translated so that the people could read it. If he didn't plant all that in hope, I would not be able to reap the harvest today. And now we are taking it, Colwyn and I, what God has, that he planted, that we've been able to harvest and to take that multiple seeds and replant it again, and we're expecting God to give even a greater harvest. So that harvest doesn't just stop after one. But if the next person takes that which has been given to them and replant it, there's another harvest. And if it gets replanted and it continues to multiply, some 10, some 50, some 60, some 100 full. And that's why we need to be people as disciples of hope. We need to be planting planting into our neighbors, planting into our community, planting into our city, you know, instead of going after each other and all kinds of negativity, let's go after each other and help each other in planting the seeds of hope. Amen. And then the in within that seed is grace, mercy, righteousness of Jesus Christ. And so that's what Paul is trying to say. He uses this word hope three times. He says, you know, the guy who plows, the guy who works the field, the guy who plants the seed, the guy who nurtured, and then the guy who comes back, he gets to be a partaker of hope. I love that. And I want us to be today partakers of hope. Amen. That's what we need to, to have. That's what we need to trust God in. I'm trusting God today that I can be a partaker of hope. How about you? Are you trusting God today that you can be a partaker of hope? And that's what we need to pray on. You know, as we pray for the sick, as we pray for those, and, and God raises up and does miracles in front of us, you know what that all is? That's a partaker of hope. That's a partaker of hope. When we gather together in prayer like we did yesterday, we're, we're trusting God that we're going to be partakers of hope. Amen? Otherwise, why gather together in prayer? 
Why pray one for another? Why read the Word of God? Why why seek after the things that are in the Word? You know why? Because we want to be partakers of hope. Are you getting it yet? And that's what God wants us to be, is partakers of hope. You know, that we get involved in the hope that God wants to give us. That's why, you know, some are planting. You know, sometimes you can plant into a lot of people's lives. I've just seen another friend that's coming up. He, you know, he's involved in planting in a lot of people's lives. That they're, you know, some of them are very derelict. Some of them have gone through wayward things. But you know what, what they do often? What my brother, a pastor, does? He keeps planting and planting. Why? Because he believes in a hope of a harvest. And they're seeing a harvest. They're seeing a harvest because, not because of who they are, but because they're planting and plowing in hope, believing that they're going to see a harvest of hope. And not only that, they're going to be partakers. And that's what God wants us to do. He doesn't want it just to, us to sit on the sidelines, does he? No, he wants us to be partakers. He wants us to get involved. He wants us to enjoy that which he's given to us. And so many, another brother just came on. He is a partaker of hope too. He plants into young men's lives and ladies' lives, him and his wife up north there in Manitoba, you know, and they're planting into people's lives. You know, they're plowing the ground. And oh, it's hard sometimes when you plow the ground. I know some of these guys. It's not easy. It's a challenge. But you know, God is faithful that when we plant, and when we plow, when we plant, and when we nurture, we will see a harvest. And not only will we see a harvest. And that's the thing. People say, oh, I just want to see a harvest. But God wants to take it further. Can you imagine? He wants you to be a partaker of that harvest. Now, I know I'm getting a little carried away here on this one particular verse. But that's what it's all about. That's what hope is all about. It's moving from the mystery into the activity. And not only into the activity, but moving into the place that we can be partakers of hope. And I'm praying that for each one of you today. You say, well, you don't know my situation. You don't know my challenge. But I can give you, some of these guys that are on here this morning can get up and give a testimony and say, you know, I can truly testify that God is a God of hope. And I've been able to be a partaker with God in seeing a tremendous harvest when it's been brought in. Amen. Well, let's continue on as Paul is teaching this to the Corinthians, he goes on in, in, in chapter 13. Well, if you happen to know what chapter 13 is in 1 Corinthians, how many of you know what it is? Most of you know it because it gets read at weddings and it gets read at different places. Well, 1 Corinthians 13 is the love chapter. And again, Paul is teaching to the Corinthian church. He says, Corinthians, I want you to get something. You got all the gifts. He talks about the gifts in chapter 12. He talks about some of the problems of the gifts in chapter 14. But he said, you know, I want to tell you how we can sort this all out and bring honor and glory to the Lord. And all the Corinthians are saying, well, how do we do that? You don't see the division. You don't see, you know, some are going this way, some are going this way. And Paul's saying, oh, when are these Christians going to understand? But then, you know what? Paul keeps teaching them why, because he has hope that God is going to do a powerful thing in the Corinthian church, and in history he has. He does powerful things. And so in 1 Corinthians 13, he's reminding them again. He said, you know, here's the love chapter, but the love chapter, you love somebody, you, you commit to somebody, because you have a hope that there is a relationship that's going to take place. And he's saying, you know, when you enter into that relationship of love with God, even though it may be a relationship with no strings attached, and you just keep loving and loving, why do you keep loving and loving? Because there's a time that you hope that down the road, that that love, which the scripture says will never fail, makes a change in that person's life. That's why we need to love our enemies. That's why we need to love people around us. Oh, sometimes people aren't very lovely, but we need to love them. Why? So that because we love them, because we believe in the hope of the Word of God. We believe in the hope that Jesus Christ will carry out what He says He will do. Let's listen in 1 Corinthians 13 as He uses the word hope. First of all, He says, well, let's back up the 6th. Uh, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. He's talking about love. And it bears all things. See, it bears. Love bears all things. Believes all things. 
That's what love is doing. But then he throws in a comma and says, not only does it do all things and bears all things, but hopes all things. So love, love is supposed to be given with hope that it's going to change, that it's going to bring about a change. You know, we don't, we don't uh, just go out and just kind of hope and, and think, well, I'm just going to, you know, oh God, just give me, you give me, give me, give me, Lord. You love me, just give me, give me, give me, Lord. No, the idea of love is given forth with the hope that it's going to change a life. It's a seed. The greatest seed that we can plant in one another is the seed of love. And when it's planted in hope, it says, hope all things endures all things. Then he goes on down to the verse 13, the last verse in here. And I, I would love to preach. I almost did that a week ago. I was thinking about a sermon to preach and I thought, here's the one I'm going to, one day I'm trusting the Lord going to unload <laughs> because he says here, and now abide faith, hope, and love in these three, but the greatest of these is love. And I was thinking about this whole idea. Wow. If there's something that the church needs to do today, if there's something that the disciples need to do today, is that we abide. And abide, if you go to John chapter 15, talks about how we abide in Christ and Christ abides in us. What, for what purpose? Well, first of all, that we may have life. And second of all, John 15 says that we may bear fruit. And Jesus tells them, you will know them by their fruit. And what are the fruit is that we're going to see from the disciples? That they have love one for another. That they have faith in Jesus Christ. And that they hope have a hope in the future that lays before them. That's what makes disciples, I guess, unique. Some people will even say, that's what makes them crazy. <laughs> that's what really stirs up the world. If you want to get under the skin of the world, stand up in faith and begin to move. Stand up in hope and to begin to go forward and stand up in love and to begin to apply it. And as you do these things, as you abide in them, it brings about a tremendous harvest, a tremendous blessing. Do you believe that? Give me a thumbs up. Do you believe that? If you, we can walk as disciples in faith, hope, and love, if we were just to abide in that, you know, forget about all the other things that are coming out, all the other voices, and just make a commitment today and say, you know, I'm going to abide in faith, hope, and love. You know, some of these guys that, that, uh, that have showed up, these other pastors, I shouldn't call them guys, I know them, you know, they're trying to walk with the best of what God gives them, with the power of the Holy Spirit. They're trying to walk as they work with other people groups. They're trying to walk in faith. Believing that as they plant the word of God, it's going to bring forth a harvest. They're believing that in faith, that as they trust God, God's going to give them, help them to be partakers of the hope that they believe that the word of God will do. And then not only that, they're believing that as they continue to pour out love, and sometimes it's hard to pour out love on the ones that are not lovely, but as they do, they believe that they're going to be partakers. See, I believe that as you abide in faith, you'll be partakers of faith. I believe that as you abide in faith, you will see and become partakers of hope. I believe that as you abide in love, you will be partakers of that love. Amen. Let's go over to 1 Corinthians again, chapter 15, verse 19. Again, he says to the church, and he's talking to them now about the risen Savior. And, and uh, verses 12 through the 19, we're not going to read all of them, but this whole thing is titled, The Risen Christ, Our Hope. That's what changed everything, that Christ is our risen Savior. You know, and that even though the Old Testament scriptures prophesied it, and the people didn't see it, many didn't see this hope. But in the proper time, in due season, the Father sent forth His Son as a gift of hope, to all who would receive him, that they would receive salvation and eternal life. That's the gift of hope that we can spend eternity. And that whole section is talking about that, about the risen Christ, our hope. And he goes on, and, he, and in verse 17, we say, Then also all those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiful 
And he's going on and saying, you know, if we just have this limited view, we need to trust. Because he goes on in verse 20, but now Christ is risen. He said, if he was just, if you were just hoping that the Messiah was coming, and that was it, that's not enough. That's more pitiful than anything. That you, you, you haven't gone the full mystery. You haven't gone to the full story. Because he uses the word but in verse 20. But now, even though that was the way it was, even though that's the way, you know, people need to understand that the importance of the resurrection power. That's what he's talking about. And the resurrection power. And he comes, he says, but now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. He has become the first fruit. There's that word fruit again. He's going to bring about, and of course it goes on to talk about how the last enemy will be destroyed. The fruit that's going to happen out of Christ's coming is the destructiveness of the enemy. That's the positive fruit that the enemy is going to be pushed back. Well, we want to read at least one more scripture here, two more scriptures before we conclude today. We're going to go into 2 Corinthians. And 2 Corinthians chapter 1 says, and it uses the word and. So that means we need to go back up. And again, this was talked about yesterday in our prayer time. Those of you who are listening in the prayer time, someone said, you know, they shared this scripture. And they said, this is important scripture to the church. And Paul was reading that. And what was it saying? Well, let's back up. He says, now, if we are afflicted, it is for your consolation or for your encouragement and salvation, which is effective for the enduring of the same sufferings, which we also suffer. Or if we are comforted, it is for your consolation or encouragement and salvation. And our hope for you is steadfast because we now we know that as you are partakers of suffering, so also you will be partakers of of consolation or of encouragement you know he again going back to this you know plowing and and planting and then uh coming along and bringing in the harvest threshing the harvest god wants us to be partakers of it he's saying just as you have gone through sufferings and trials yeah he said i know you've gone through sufferings and trials but your hope has been steadfast. And because your hope has been steadfast, you are going to be partakers of consolation. Now, we don't know this word consolation that easy, but a great synonym for the word consolation is encouragement. You're going to be partakers of encouragement. When you have hope, there is a day coming. There is a day coming, God promises, that I'm going to encourage you. You're going to be encouraged. I'm, you know... I'm so encouraged by sometimes what God is doing. I don't expect how he's going to do it. I don't know how he's going to move, how he's going to provide. A lot of the things, you know, we just step out and hope Cohen and I, and we trust that God's going to do this or God's going to do that. And we're, you know, and we're just walking out in faith. And then he starts bringing the picture together. He starts bringing in the people. Some people will give financially. Some people will pray. Some people will get involved in translating and work. It's amazing how he brings something together why because he wants to be partakers of encouragement and what does encouragement do it builds up hope well in 2 Corinthians 3 12 is our last verse for today he then says I, I love it when he starts out with the word therefore because that means it goes back and he's talking about how important it is for the, the glory of the new covenant what Christ has done is the new covenant in the midst of him explaining to the church of the new covenant. So he had, there is, there was Gentiles in there and proselytes. There were foreigners. There were all kinds of people in this Corinthian church because it was a kind of a hub, a place that you kind of pass through to go on to another place. And he was trying to again talk to him about the and get an understanding about what this new covenant in Christ was all about. And then as he goes down explaining, it, he says in verse 12, therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech. And I think that's why it's, this is exciting. Because of the hope we have, if we really truly have hope in Christ, we can't shut up. <laughs> we're going to talk about it, and we're going to share, and we're going to have, as Paul says, boldness of speech. I'm praying today that God is going to fill us with great hope. And that out of that great hope that as he 
nurtures us and plants those seeds of hope and brings us to the place that is going to rise up within us a great boldness, a great boldness to share the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ to others. And I love it that he uses the word speak. You know, he's saying, speak it out. Not only speak it out in prayer, but speak it out to your neighbors. Speak it out wherever you go. Because people today, amen, need to hear about hope. They need seeds planted of hope in them. And remember, remember this, that God wants you to be a partakers of hope so you can continue to encourage others. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord Jesus, for this word hope. We thank you, Lord, for how these scriptures are encouraging us that you want us to be partakers of hope and not only be partakers, but that we would speak boldly around about to others about how we have a hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. I thank you for giving us hope. I thank you for pouring hope into us. And I pray that you would not only pour it into us, but you would pour it through us into others. And I thank you for these pastors and leaders and others that have watched today. Oh God, give them much more hope. Give them much more faith. Give them much more love. And Lord, that we will, out of these three things, we will see a great revival amongst your people, amongst the people of this world, amongst the people that we serve with, that you would be glorified. And we just are going to give you all the thanks and all the praise now. In your precious name we pray, Jesus. Amen and amen. Well, God bless you. It's good to be with you again this morning. And I just want to encourage you. Go out and be partakers of hope today. Amen. We love you. And Lord willing, We'll see you again tomorrow, okay? Bye-bye now.